as a young lawyer or a law student we have to counter so many challenges starting from the confusion on how to start your career should you join a seniors chamber a law firm or an aor or filing office is it necessary to have good drafting skills to argue well in court how can you start making a good client base as a young advocate and likewise we will seek answer to each one of these primary challenges in this video Hello everyone I am Mayank and you are watching Legit Affairs at Legal Bites The guests for this episode are two young advocates Guneet and Pushpendra I warmly welcome Guneet and Pushpendra for this show at Legal Bites. There are so many questions which we are going to ask Guneet and Pushpendra but I will start with the very first questions which I have for you is very repetitive but yet very important one. What are the challenges faced by young advocates in New Delhi? I have asked this question to uh, many senior lawyers also but I'll be asking the next gen today as to what are the challenges? okay so um, i think i'll uh, being the younger one i think i'll take a shot at that um, i'm still on a provisional license but what i can tell you is that uh, delhi has a lot of opportunities but that also means a lot of competition so therefore it is very important to have a domain knowledge and certain expertise at the very start so that you bring something new to the table so in my very limited experience what i can tell you is that delhi is not a place for general practice of law and uh, of course right out of law school it is very difficult to find your expertise per se but of course i feel that one should start at least working towards it and that will because that's one of the biggest challenges uh, you face and uh, i think the second thing that comes to mind is uh, uh, of course uh, finding a good fit for yourself because a career in litigation as you know uh, at least initially it's not very rewarding financially speaking so therefore it is very important to choose a chamber firm or a seniors chamber as per one's uh, own preferences and uh, expectations i totally agree with puneet before we start i want to clarify that i belong to a place which is uh, nearly i have no experience in the litigations in a law field i am a first generation lawyer started in i have, my parents were always support uh, supported me to choose law so when i chose law i did my graduation from uh, national university visakhapatnam then after that i was clear about that i will go into litigation and my path was always in my mind that i want to do litigation so so you have to clear about all those things because in delhi it's a very competitive market because everyone wants to come to delhi because there is lot of forums in delhi there is supreme court this high court this various tribunals so you have this diverse area of practices so you have to clear about one thing you have to choose one thing and focus on that so if you focus on that you will surely and eventually will find a part to deal with every obstacle which you which you will face the next question is again evergreen like most students in law schools are confused on how to start their career should they choose a, a join a seniors chamber a law firm or an aor or a filing office where should they start please uh, guide us on that so my take on this is that uh, i the only thing i took away from jurisprudence in university is that uh, common law generally is a process of uh, learning it's a skill set you can't learn it just by reading something if you know so the the main thing is it's a kind of osmosis you have to learn it through the culture and interacting with the system so keeping that in mind i think an aor or an office where there's a lot of filing or perhaps an up and coming senior is much better because the gulf between you and the your senior who you are assisting is not very large uh 
you can get great advice at various moments because that senior has been through that not a long time ago and of course i feel that in a the most important thing is in a bigger outfit such as a corporate firm or even a senior's chamber because of the sheer stake of matters you are as close to the action as one can possibly be without really being a part of it and in that regard i feel that joining an aor or filing office i can tell you from personal experience in my second or third month i was directly speaking to clients handling filings and that is the process on through which you know you develop as a as a good lawyer in my opinion so in so to my mind joining a filing office where there's a lot of drafting work or an aor's office is perhaps the best option the caveat being that one has to keep in mind uh, your uh, skill set of course there's a lot of uh, other areas such as compliance uh, or mna if that is your domain uh, expertise then joining a firm may be better for you but strictly speaking for litigation i feel that an aor or a filing office is much better in addition to that if you if you directly join a senior chamber you will not know about the nuances of the law the you will not know what goes into a file what are the pleadings so th- it will be a difficulty it will be an obstacle for you in the future to argue for any court of law so you just have to be clear about those things in the initial years of your career then you can go and argue in a court or later on join a senior chamber then learn about the nuances of the arguments but first you have to be clear about your basics so it's, i would suggest if someone is starting a, a career in litigation then one should start with the litigation office one should start with very basic thing to learn how to draft a pleading how to file it how to clear any objection if marked by the registry so these are the things uh, any senior will not teach is the thing you will go into the court you will learn by yourself so but still uh, people get confused that if they start as you say that you start with the basics they go to these basics uh, during the five years of their law college they go for internships and they try learning all those things but people generally are very afraid to start from there thinking that maybe if they start from such a level will they be able to go to the next level or will they remain stuck at this azari what is your take on that if you are working uh, if if you are learning then i i will suggest in my uh, experience of 3 years when i started working uh, with mr jasmith singh i was not aware about anything but i can tell you now that i can do a, a case from a scratch to the arguments also so this is the thing you will never stuck in such process you will eventually learn everything and i so think that this is always a dilemma i agree but you have to come through it correct i i agree with pushpender in that uh, you know there is a very strong perception in uh, uh, in uh, you know amongst my colleagues as well that you know drafting and uh, perhaps appearing in lower courts at the initial stage has nothing to do with arguing well basically that if assuming becoming being designated as senior is the goal drafting and things such as that are extraneous i think that is uh, that is not correct because uh, without really understanding what goes into pleadings you will have a very superficial understanding of the case at hand of course you can write uh, you know as in law school you know we are all talking about the basic structure the cutting edge of uh, jurisprudence constitutional law but that is only one aspect of the legal profession we we uh, most seniors uh, you know if i may say so get the meat of the matter you know when when arguments have to be uh, have to commence and things which are unresolved but for the larger part you have to deal with procedure uh, whether your affidavits are correct and we've seen that cases rise and fall on those very things so it's for that reason that one has to start from the basics great okay with the basics there is the next question that is it necessary to have a good drafting skills to argue well in court because we have seen people who may not have good drafting skills but they have been mooting very well in the law colleges well i think you want to answer it uh yeah i think uh, you know we always quote shakespeare that what of thought best but not so well expressed if your yeah. drafting isn't good your clarity of thought won't be there and clarity of thought is most important in arguments i can tell you for a fact that at least initially 
uh, when files come to you, it's very difficult to understand how to go about it unless you've been in that process of uh, starting from researching, drafting, and ultimately briefing a senior and seeing the judgment come through. If you've not seen that entire process, uh, of, of which drafting is a very integral part, I don't think one can become a good arguing counsel. Uh, in my uh, limited experience, that that's what I've seen. Because you'll mostly be judged on your written work, at least at the initial stages. Puspendra, will you like to add anything? Yeah, there's one thing I want to add. So if you are good with your drafting skills, there's come sometimes there comes a question from a judge which not even in a file. So if you are good with your thought thought process, then you then you you will be you will be able to answer it. You will be able to frame it then and there. So it is necessary to have a good drafting skill before going into the learning into the argument skills because a drafting skill will, like Gunit said, uh, it will clear your thought process, how to deal with something, how to answer something, how to express something. So that's why a dra good drafting skill, a skill is very necessary uh, in litigation uh, career. All right, moving on. Is there a mantra or a strategy using which one can start uh, like making a good client base as a young advocate? Is there a mantra? Uh, there is no mantra, I guess. Uh, it's just you deliver, deliver and deliver. Then your name and fame will become your uh, profile. Then you will get more and more clients. So earlier days, what happened, uh, what, what used to happen, that client will give you a case and forget about his case. But nowadays, clients are more are keen to know what's happening in their case, what is the what happened in that date, what happens now. So you have to satisfy client each on each and every day. So to satisfy your client to best of your abilities, this is the basic thing you can do to get more clients. So basic and more effective. I think uh, to that, what I would also like to add is to what we've answered before. So in an outfit such as ours, so at Joshi and Singh, we, we are actually encouraged to have our own clients as long as the work that is being given to you by a senior, that is not compromised. In fact, we are encouraged to do so. And I think the most important aspect is, of course, one has to uh, socialize, take out time and uh, meet more people. That is one of the ways you can make clients. But of course, another thing is that even if a brief is handed over to you by your senior who you are assisting, try and go beyond the brief put more time and effort. And I can assure you that that is noticed not only by the clients, but also by the senior. Which by the senior. will bear me out that, you know, it's the best feeling when a senior during the briefing or a client says that this is the point that even I didn't think of, or you <laughs> know, this, this is a very clever point. And if you go that extra mile, naturally the client will be impressed and there is a very li high likelihood that they'll eventually come back to you as well. Another thing I think which I may add is that uh, in our generation, we feel that getting clients in litigation, if not from a litigation background, is impossible. I agree there is a huge obstacle, but there are ways. For instance, I have done a lot of freelancing work on Upwork.com. And, uh, and I was actually amazed to find out the kind of lucrative projects that you can bid for on Upwork. And in that time, I've met great clients from Hong Kong, from US, I've advised them on certain issues such as employment contracts. So that is also one of the ways in which uh, you can make your own clients. So the idea is to uh, uh, firstly not consider litigation as a job, uh, try and enjoy it, go beyond the brief and being proactive is my uh, understanding on how to uh, get more clients as a young adult. So there is no straight jacket formula to get clients so you just have to do all those things all you have to just uh, take yourself that extra mile to get to your clients so you both are involved in a litigation i have got to know that concerning the attachment of about 8.6 million usd of a european company by the ed can you briefly tell us what are the issues in this case and provide a brief overview of rights of third parties under pmla uh well, uh, yes, that is right. Uh, this matter is actually, it's currently sub judice. So there's not a lot that we can say about it, but yes, that is correct. Uh, there are uh, monies that have been attached and right now it's at the stage of uh, confirmed provisional attachment and a claim petition 
has been filed by the company concerned in that regard and uh, as far as third party rights are concerned i think when we need uh, uh, to elaborate on this we'll need uh, another episode and uh, and your precious time but the brief overview that i can give to you is uh, is that uh, the pmla is fraught with uh, diverging interpretations high courts have taken different views and the need of the hour is to have finality on these issues that is the caveat with which i'd like to start and rights of third parties under pmla are even more important today and in my opinion should be discussed beyond courtrooms i'll give a very simple illustration let's say you buy a home you've taken a home loan you borrow from friends and family you put your life savings into buying that home and you've checked the title of that property as well later on a few months later it is found that the seller of this property is has indulged in malpractice and he is being hounded by investigative agencies and it is found that the house that you have purchased is actually a proceed of crime now we have cases where a legitimate buyer is also being hounded by investigative agencies which is definitely not the intent of the act so before telling you the legal provisions i would like to clarify that it is not as if that the act is being misused in my uh, reading of the act and the cases which have come in it's that the act is open to a lot of misinterpretation and at the outset hats off to agencies like the ed because there are vicious criminals there are devices to uh, place layer and integrate laundered proceeds of crime into the legitimate uh, system, uh, legitimate economy which has systemic effects but that may be so we have to ensure that pmla doesn't become an instrument of oppression so looking at third party rights as a claimant uh, uh, under the pmla you can file a claim petition under section 88 of the pmla and interestingly this has only come in 2015 which is a good thing in the sense that the legislature is aware that there may be bona fide claimants whose properties may have been attached which should be restored however the problem is when you implement this and this is a, an issue which is uh, uh, most lawyers on the defense side will agree on this even the rules uh, mayank for restoring properties have come in 2019 and the act uh, i believe has been in force since 2005 now we have cases where between 2005 and 2019 you being a legitimate interest holder have no remedy at all so in that regard i i feel that uh, the law uh, has to be clarified and the most important judgment for third party rights is of course the seema ghar case which is a treaties on this subject it's been uh, given by division bench of uh, punjab and harana high court i was a very small part of this case because i was assisting the asg when this uh, brief had come in around 2018 or 2019 now to give a very simple illustration uh, of third party rights let's say i take 100 rupees from a bank i commit forgery and i also commit cheating to obtain that loan let's say the bank files a complaint and a, an fir is subsequently registered now as you will know forgery and cheating are predicate offenses which means that the ed can now take cognizance of this matter and attach these 100 rupees now what can the bank do the matter is then sent to the adjudicating authority after the amount is provisionally attached the adjudicating authority will ask uh, me where have you got this money from and let's say i say that i have taken this as a loan from this bank and naturally one would think that the adjudicating authority will also give a notice to the bank to say to for the bank to explain why was this uh, loan given in this manner and questions of that sort but from a practical standpoint a lot of these notices are not issued to third parties 
at the stage of adjudication now if that is done the only recourse you have is to file a claim petition under section 8 and uh, if you add more complexities to this uh, example when you see this act in play you realize at some at some stages it's as if the objective of the act is not even being achieved now in my example let's say that 100 rupees is not even available i have put it into a lottery ticket i don't have that 100 rupees the ed can today attach anything worth 100 rupees that belongs to me because of a very peculiar definition of proceeds of crime under the pmla now when that happens we have an issue of prioritization of interests let's say the ed attaches my shareholding in a company which is worth 100 rupees and let's say that triggers something such as the takeover code so things get uh, things get more complex then two laws the two special statute come in the contradictory to each other for example if if a company involve if the ex directors of the company involve in a predicate offense so ed will come and attach the property of the company now what happens they are also default the payments the uh, legal loan they have taken from the various banks they defaulted their payments so insolvency process started against the company now resolution professional will be appointed he will be left with no role because all the properties of the company will get attached because of the power used by the ed under pml act so what will he do so the legislature is quite clear about it what happened uh, uh, in 2019 there is a second amendment brought by the indian legislature to incorporate one section in ibc which is section 32a which says the liabilities of the prior offences will not affect the process under this law under the code for example if the ed attaches the property of the corporate debtor for a company uh, uh, th then uh, the section 32a will come into play every attached property will be available for the resolution professional for the effective resolution pro process of that company so it kind so, it, so now the issue will come which law will prevail over because uh, pml is also a special uh, statute and insolvency code is also a special statute so section 238 of Insol insolvency code provides the uh, uh, says that this uh, code will prevail over all the acts so recently uh, national company law appellate tribunal in one of the case held that that insolvency law is basically subsequent in time is came uh, recently however pml is uh, enacted in 2002 that's why this ibc will prevail over it but the issue is getting more complex there is no clarity over which uh, law will prevail over which law so but there is a section which given by the legislature that 32a any offenses committed by the prior directors of the company will not affect the resolution profess, uh, process of that company and those asset will be readily av available for the smooth and effective resolution process of the company i think just to add to what pushpinder said it's very interesting to see how pmla interacts with a more friendlier code such as the ibc under the ibc we are more concerned with a trying to ensure that the companies are going concern and of course the larger question is prioritization of interests now in our reading of the pmla the attachment and adjudication think of it like an accelerated civil suit by the government and what the government thinks that this fellow owes me because of the larger systemic impact of money laundering that people who indulge in these activities ought to be paralyzed but we have situations where not only like pushpinder mentioned there are third party private interests of financial institutions in our example of 100 rupees let's say the income tax department wanted to sell my shares uh to recover some areas due from me now we have the ed not only at odds with private institutions but also government institutions and proto government institutions such as lic so we need finality on these issues and of course the litigation that you have mentioned we are uh, relying on our good senses because there's a not, not a lot of precedents it's fraught with difficulties this act 
but uh, of course it's been a great learning experience uh, being involved in this case these two laws are actually evolving laws i guess there will be an amendment in the future to separate both the operation areas clearly clarify it ki which law will prevail over what thank you so much for answering all my questions and sharing your recent experience with our audience i thank all our viewers for your support please don't forget to like share and comment you can also comment with your doubts and concerns with regards to pmla and i hope our guests will guide you by responding to them jai hind jai bharat